use issues. Yeah, so Peter, please have the floor. Thank you very much, Kwame. Thanks, and thanks to all dear colleagues who are joining today. Just to check, uh, my audio is okay. You can hear me, it's fine. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I would like to share screen if possible. Yes, it's possible, please go ahead. Okay. And are you seeing this? Are you seeing uh, the screen now? No, we can not see. Yet. Rain not not yet. Yet. No. Okay, hold on a sec. Share screen. Yeah, okay. Let's try this one. And Yeah, it's coming now. Great. Okay, very good. Very good. Okay. Um, well, I am very glad that we started the conversation by asking people what they know about climate solutions and false solutions and true solutions. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the language that's used to describe climate solutions. And I want all of you, please, um, to answer two questions as I do so. The first question is, uh, how familiar are you with this term, with this label for climate solutions? If you are very familiar, it's a five. If it's the first time you've heard this term, it's zero. The second question is, is this a true solution or a false solution? If you think, yes, this is a good solution, this is a good climate solution, give it a plus five. If you think, no, this is bad, this is greenwashing, this is a false solution, then give a zero. So let's start. Nature-based solutions. Net zero. Have you heard of net zero? And is this a true solution or a false solution? What about avoided emissions? How about reduced emissions? Removals. Rights-based approaches, rights-based climate solutions. And finally, JMA, which is Joint Mitigation and Adaptation Actions. Now, all of these have been described as climate solutions. How familiar are these terms? Where do we see them used? This is what we want to unpack and understand better during this uh, webinar. Hold on a sec. So let's let's start with this nature-based solutions. This is something we hear a lot about, and many nationally determined contributions will use the phrase nature-based solutions. Um, those in Clara network um, usually oppose the term nature-based solutions, and we will talk about why. Uh, it's not necessarily a false solution, but it is a false framing of the problem. Then we have net zero. Net zero being the way that increasingly countries and companies are talking about climate ambition. And this includes the idea that emissions can be offset with removals of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Again, Clara feels the net zero frame is very dangerous uh, and we've done some work 
to pursue that. How about avoided emissions? Well, that's a good thing. We want to avoid emissions. But at the same time, there's an attempt by some countries and some companies to say that they should be rewarded for avoiding emissions based on a projection of future emissions, which they will then avoid and should be compensated for that. So a true solution, false solution, depends on circumstances. Reduced emissions, yes, that's what we want. We want actual reduction in greenhouse gas emissions to fight the climate crisis. Removals, this is a technical term that means the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. When trees grow, they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this is the, uh, this is the term that's used uh, in both the science and policy realms of the UNCCC. The idea of net zero is that you would balance uh, emissions with removals. This balancing, we think, is a, is a problem, is possibly a false solution. Rights-based approaches, rights-based climate solutions. True, false solution. We think this is the true and most important climate solution, our rights-based. And finally, once again, coming back to the technical, there are solutions in the land sector that have mitigation benefits and also adaptation benefits. This has been codified uh, or formalized as joint mitigation adaptation or JMA. So this is just a, an overview of the kinds of terms that are used to talk about true and false solutions. We have to come to our own understanding of what these terms mean. In Clara's view, it's a true climate solution if it strengthens land rights for communities. If the climate solution increases local community control and agency, meaning the ability um, to act for social good, <clears throat> it's a true climate solution if it increases biodiversity. Here we come back to the JMA, the Joint Mitigation Adaptation, which also includes increases in biodiversity. <clears throat> it's a true solution if it allows regeneration of natural forest. And finally, and probably most importantly, it's a true solution if it protects and expands livelihood opportunities. We are in the policy world dealing with this issue of nature-based solutions, which doesn't give us much guidance, really, what it means. Instead, Clara and others are using this three-step approach, which is protection, restoration, and sustainable management to protect, restore, and sustainably manage. Those are our tasks, and that is the sequence in which these tasks should be addressed. So what is actually meant by nature-based solutions? If it doesn't follow this approach of protection, restoration, and only then the consideration of sustainable management, uh, we have some doubts about whether it's an actual solution or not. And this is a graphic that we created to illustrate the challenge. Fossil fuel corporations like Total and Shell and airlines like the Emirates and Qantas want to offset their emissions <clears throat> by purchasing carbon credits. We think this is a form of corporate greenwashing and it's that it's not a real solution. If you'll see on the top of our greenwash car wash, you'll see a big tank that says nature-based solutions. So our belief is that the nature-based solutions frame is part of the greenwashing approach <clears throat> and we shouldn't fall into the trap, <clears throat> fall into the pattern 
of using the term nature-based solutions. So when they talk about nature-based solutions, how do we respond? We respond with protect, restore, and sustainably manage. We talk about the need for adaptation finance. Adaptation finance is missing. Focus only on mitigation without attention to rights, biodiversity, and adaptation. That's a false solution. We talk about rights, and we should stay focused on rights-based approaches, rights-based solutions, also ecosystem-based approaches, which as some of you will know, is language that is now found in the Convention on Biological Diversity. This kind of thinking also should be brought in to the climate discussion. When they talk about carbon markets, we respond by pointing out opportunities in non-market approaches. We talk about community-led solutions, and we talk about building a solidarity economy. And finally, addressing the climate challenge also should mean keeping focused on the sustainable development goals and meeting the SDGs. Why the problem with offsets? Well, 60 million years of planet history has led to the creation of coal reserves and oil reserves, and we're burning them very, very quickly. The idea that we can offset 60 million years of fossil carbon by increasing removals in forests and ecosystems, this is just a crazy idea. It's just crazy. We cannot offset our way to net zero. But net zero is the way that many corporate and country pledges are coming forward, and we should be very sensitive to what it all means. When they talk about net zero, we need to change the conversation. We need deep and immediate cuts in emissions, emission reductions. That is our core uh, need. That is the core of a true climate solution. We also will oppose the use of offsets and carbon credits as part of the false solution. Kwame, I think I, I will leave it here. I thank you all very much for your attention and the opportunity to speak here today. I'm very interested to hear from other presenters. I will stop sharing screen now and turn it back to you, Kwame. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you so much for the brilliant presentation. Um, yeah. So now it's very clear. So we always propose the first solution with our true solutions that we promote. So it's clear that the true solution protects community livelihoods, increases biodiversity, and increases community control. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So uh, on the screen, you can see the results uh, from the uh, short survey that we did uh, before uh, uh, Peter speaks. Um, yeah. So um, what we mean by uh, four solutions, uh, climate solutions. Thank you, Corina, for showing this. So um, we were in line with uh, um, Peter. If I may say, Peter, you are still here. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Thank you once again. Um, for that. So let's move on to the second speaker. The second speaker will be speaking on bioenergy plantations and the links to carbon market and fossil industries. The second speaker is Vanessa. Vanessa Cabanelas is environmental activist and biologist. She's uh, one of the Justice Ambiental Friends of the Earth Mozambique founding members. She's coordinating the land, livelihoods, and ecosystems program at Justice Ambiental. Please join me to welcome Vanessa. 
for the presentation. Vanessa, you have the, the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Kwame. I'm not sure if you can hear me properly. Can I share my screen? Yes, please go ahead. We, we can hear you. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to find out where I do the slideshow. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Kwame, for this opportunity. Thank you also, Peter, for facilitating with your first presentation. It made it so clear for us what are the false uh, solutions and what we are we need to resist even more against. I will be speaking mostly on monoculture plantations and their impacts in, in Mozambique in particular, but uh, unfortunately the impacts that we see in Mozambique, we see all over Africa. Uh, Mozambique is considered the seventh poorest country in the world, one of the most vulnerable uh, countries to climate change impacts as we have seen in the past five years, in the last five years, we have been hit by at least three or four tropical storms with very, very serious uh, economic and social impacts. Mozambique is also considered very rich in natural resources, which include lands, uh, forests and other resources. But unfortunately, our forest area has also seen an alarming decrease. And in the past 11 years, Mozambique lost more than 8 million acres of native forest. Poverty and hunger are intrinsically linked with food insecurity being prevalent in most rural areas. Around 24% of households suffer from chronic food insecurity. The government of Mozambique believes that development of our country will be done through direct foreign investment. And this is mainly through large scale land and resource intensive projects, plantations, gas projects, coal, hydroelectric dams. This is all also being pushed by the need to secure energy, both regionally and also in Europe, given the latest developments of Ukraine and Russia. Unfortunately for Africa, we are on the spotlight as always. With these projects, community lose their lands to give way for these projects, and then they will lose it, lose even further lands to, to implement these offset carbon offsetting projects. So land grabbing is happening, and it's been um, land conflicts have been increasing since 2010, 2011. So this is not new, but they have been increasing. Land grab in Mozambique has been facilitated by the government. There's an increase in land conflicts affecting many, many rural communities all over our country. Unfortunately, we say that it's facilitated by government because decisions on land, on issuing land are made by central government and implemented at local and provincial level. Our government is also highly dependent on, fin on financing from international financial institutions such as the World Bank, the IMF, and the African Development Bank and other major European Union donors. Our state budget is actually very dependent. It's around 40 to 50% of our state budget comes from these sources, these donors. So we are quite vulnerable to the imposition of foreign agendas and neoliberal agendas and all these false solutions. Uh, these, these false climate solutions have made, have, we have seen many changes also in Mozambique uh, to address these false climate solutions, but basically preparing to, to actually be able to implement them. Our government has developed the RED strategy with funding from the World Bank. It has also developed uh, and approved a reforestation strategy that also facilitates, it's, it's basically aimed at facilitating these red schemes and carbon markets. Our national forest definition was also modified in order to accommodate the definition of monoculture plantations. So these can also be brought into our forest law. So the national land use planning, which has been ongoing for a few years, I'm not quite sure if it's now finalized, has identified suitable agroecological areas for food production. But although these areas have been identified as priority for food production, still they are attributed to plantation companies, including Porto Cell, which is a very well-known uh, Portuguese company. There's been huge lobby from the Global North and these corporations to implement these false solutions, be it Red Plus schemes, natural-based solutions through monoculture plantations, especially in climate-smart agriculture. 
uh, just to give an example, when the EU developed, the, Un the European Union developed the green economy, Mozambique was one of the first countries to sign on to it. Uh, the role of our state at all levels has been also always to create policies and regulations aimed at facilitating the implementation of these false solutions in the country and aimed at attracting more investment. Currently, we have been under, uh, our government has, has been reviewing the land policy since 2020. This has been a very problematic uh, process because it was launched in 2020 at the hype of, of the COVID pandemic where of course, as in many other countries, we had many restrictions to meetings and to, and to be able to launch a review of a land policy, which is so important and deals and has impact in so many people, in all of us actually, in the development in the future of our country, in a moment where we cannot have these proper public consultations was very complicated. The main aim for this uh, review at this moment is actually to respond to the challenges of consolidating structures of the market economy. This is what has been said to be the aim of this uh, land policy. Although the review of the land policy does not intend to, 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 to privatize the land, it is the first step to, to, to making possible the market of land, because in Mozambique, land is state owned, you cannot sell it or, or, or by any chance buy it, but it is being sold and bought uh, at informal markets. So government has seen that there's space to make money from this from these sales and also government needs to secure land for these investments and not to go through all the community consultation processes that are long. And, and complicated and for investors, they are not very attractive. So we need to make, so the government believes they need to make our land policy more attractive for investors. Of course, this has, this has seen a lot of pro protests from civil society organizations, a lot of, of um, back and forth meetings. And at this stage, the final draft of the land policy has been submitted to parliament and let's see what comes out. Unfortunately, many of, of the issues and concerns of civil society were not taken into consideration. Uh, another important uh, legal instrument to facilitate this, these false solutions is the forest law, which is currently under review. And where we've seen, we have seen them, this, a few versions of this document and plantations are being highly promoted. They include tax exemptions and other benefits for plantation companies and for whoever has the interest of establishing plantations. On the other end, community-based initiatives such as community forest management is not at all um, prioritized. And again, we see that forest people and forest conservation is not the priority. Priority is business as usual through through uh, monoculture plantations and big agribusiness. And the third instrument that is very concerning also, which is also reducing the space of civil society, is a law on a very recent law that was approved by the Council of Ministers on the nonprofit, the law of nonprofit organizations. And it basically intends to control and micromanage every NGO in Mozambique. Of course, this does not include cultural NGOs or, or dealing with sports, but basically the NGOs that are denouncing uh, human rights violations, that are denouncing these government plans for this, for fossil fuels, for um, hydroelectric dams, whoever is resisting and calling out the government for the bad choices they're making will definitely face um, a lot of complications if this law is passed. It, is, it will currently be submitted to the parliament, but again, there's, there's a movement already protesting this. Uh, as most of the Mozambican territory is made up of forests or cover in some sort of vegetation, it can always be used for carbon sequestration and red plus includes all of this soils, agriculture. So the possibility of more areas of Mozambique being used or ordered for red projects is quite high. So we need to be um, on the lookout and we need to understand what are the main, the main impacts of these projects. The two main programs, uh, the two main red programs in Mozambique currently working is the World Bank's uh, Forest Carbon Partnership Facility and also the UN REDs. 
Um, another interesting issue is that the government of Mozambique has committed to restoring 1 million hectares of degraded land by 2030. But at the same time, on the land, on the national, refo uh, national reforestation strategy, it, the government also has a, a commitment to plant or to establish 1 million hectares of monoculture plantations. So there will be no restoration per se, but, but yes, implementation of what at least the intention is to establish monoculture plantations. And going specifically, specifically on the monoculture plantations in Mozambique, until today, around 700,000 hectares of land has been allocated to plantation companies. Only 10% of this, of this area has been planted already. The two major companies in acting, operating in Mozambique until today are Porto Cell Mozambique, which has a huge amount of land, but still planted, uh, fortunately planted only 10% of it, and Green Resources, which is a Norwegian company, also with a, with a very big area, but planted very little, and has many conflicts, especially in the Nampula province. It's been operating and it bought many other smaller plantations in Zambezi and Nyasa, but in Nampula, it has been said, unfortunately, still unconfirmed information, that it has abandoned their plantations. Well, they are abandoned. What will happen next, we, we don't know yet. As for the impacts, um, for us, it's, it's, we've been working with uh, communi rural communities impacted by these monoculture plantations for more than 10 years. So to list the impacts, it seems quite easy, but we need to understand that we're talking about entire communities suffering from the same issues. And it's not only happening in Mozambique. When you discuss this, these matters regionally and with our comrades from Friends of the Earth Africa, we see that this is happening in every African country where there's monoculture plantations. I have even asked for good examples of monoculture plantations or that have actually developed these, these communities and I have seen none in Africa uh, until today. The main impact that we've seen is the loss of productive land, food in, which, which results in food insecurity. Many of these people are, are cheated to believe that their, their lives will be better. Many of these communities are made several promises of improved livelihoods, of schools, of building roads and, and improving their lives in, in general, but end up even poorer than they were because at least at, before the plantations came, they had their land and they could produce their own food and sell it. There's a loss of livelihoods, of crops, of fruit trees. There's also restricted access to water and other resources. As by other resources, we are meaning like forest resources, be it wood or forest fruits or even medicine. There's an increase also in local corruption. Normally, guards or influence, influence people from the communities charge money to, to put other community members in the list for, for job opportunities. So this has, has seen a huge increase in local corruption. Those who refuse to give away their land normally are left with no compensation and are surrounded by trees. Basically, they have no choice. Either they give away their land or they are left with nothing. And being surrounded by trees, and it did happen to several people, uh, to several community members, but they end up leaving their, their areas after a few years because they cannot continue producing as they did. There has been also many cases of intimidation and direct threats to members of the community who speak against the, the company, who speak against local government uh, officers who are supporting and protecting company, the company. Women also complain a lot of forced sexual favors in exchange for promises of employment, in exchange for access to the social responsibility programs these companies have, and even in exchange for passage through their plantations from the security guards. There is from, the, from these companies, it's also very interesting to realize that in, in the, the global north where most of these companies come from and where the, the funders of these of these companies come from, they, they pass an image of transparency and access to information, but in Mozambique, they refuse to give information which is considered by law um, public information, such as uh, access to their land acquisition processes, to the compensation process, because on one end, we have community members saying that they were not compensated, they did not receive any compensation, or 
that the compensation wasn't fair. On the other side, we have the companies uh, stating or alleging that they have paid compensation and that the whole process was done very fairly, but yet they refuse to show us documents proving that they have paid this, um, what amount they've paid and what they've paid exactly. They also refuse to share their social and environmental monitoring reports with us. These two companies, these two biggest companies, Portocell and Green Resources particularly, we had as Justice Ambiental, we had to take them to court so they could um, present their, their reports. We are still waiting for the reports, but at least we won the case. And it's clear that we have, we have the right to have access to this information. There, from what we've seen in these years, and we've been monitoring these plantations and monitoring the impacts on these communities for more than 10 years, from what we've seen, there's no positive impact. There's no economic development. There's no improvement of livelihoods. There's only worsening of, of the poverty that was already there. Yes, but there's, it's worse now. We have seen also that women, children, and the elderly are the most affected due to their vulnerability, due to their sexual roles in the community, their daily routine is greatly impacted. Families who lose their land normally can no longer afford to pay school books and uniforms. And in these cases, priority is always given to the boys. The girls normally have to abandon school. And it's not that they want to abandon school, they have no choice but to abandon school. Another very important complaint many women have made is that the fact that between their houses and the school, there's a plantation and they're very scared to go through the plantation. They're scared, they fear sexual abuse, they fear rape, and it has happened according to these community members. There's also an increase in child marriages and in sexually transmitted diseases for the same reasons, because families can no longer feed all their families the girls and the young girls are the first ones to go to leave, drop out of school and to be married so someone else can feed them and someone else can take care of them. Uh, it is also important to note that not the impacts of these monoculture plantations are not only economic impacts that we see on the ground, they're not only serious environmental impacts because these plantations are not being established in damaged areas or in, in poor soil. These are competing directly with fertile land that the communities are using to produce food. Mozambique is a food insecure country still, and we are, our government is choosing to establish monoculture plantations instead of promoting food production agroecologically um, in an agroecological way. These plantations also harm the dignity. They violate the rights of women, of children and men. They remove them from their lands. They dispossess them of their cultural, spiritual and traditional places. They devalue their traditional knowledge and expertise. These people, these rural communities have been living in this area and have been protecting their environment for centuries, for many, many years. Some of them have been there forever. Their families have been there. And now they're being dispossessed of these lands to make way for these monoculture plantations. And they become more dependent on the companies, more dependent on the government for food, for energy, for everything that they need. It was quite, um, it, it was quite an impact to hear women, especially a group of women from these affected communities in the Nampula province, uh, province speaking about the impact of, on women. And the fact that at first glance, we saw that these women were sitting all together and far away from the men and far away from us. And we tried to understand why they were sitting so far away from us. And as we approached them, we could see that they were, they were embarrassed. They were not at ease with our presence. I sat beside them and I started asking questions, what we feel about what we are discussing, what are the impacts? And the first thing they told me was that they were ashamed to be close, of, close to us because they, they could not have, uh, they could smell bad because they could not bathe as usual and as regularly because water was so far away. They had to walk around three hours to get to the closest water point. And this affects their dignity. This affects their position in society. It's not only about the impacts to the lands, but it's the impacts to each individual that has been living in this situation, in this reality. What do we need to do? We need to build solidarity. We need to regain people power. We need to resist 
not only monoculture plantations, but all these false solutions, because they, they these will not at all serve us, and especially in Africa, where we will be so much infected by the, the by climate change. But we did not contribute for this problem, so we need to find other solutions. We need to reject all of this. Thank you. I'll stop here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Vanessa. Thank you so much for uh, bringing the link between uh, the climate force solutions and their impact on the ground. Um, it's always shocking uh, hearing this presentation where uh, communities are suffering because of um, force solutions, uh, nature-based solution, net zero that promotes plantations and land grabbing in Africa. That's, that's, um, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, um, for that. Especially women are mostly affected. And uh, yeah, I think this fight needs to be continued because we can't allow things continue to happen in Africa like that. Thank you for Peter and Vanessa for your presentations. Now we're going to open the floor for questions comments and reflections. Um, yeah, who want to go first? Who has a question? I don't see any hands yet, but I have uh, one question to Peter and one to Vanessa maybe to warm up before uh, other questions comes in. Peter, will you, will you like to emphasize more? Because I want, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand what is the difference between nature-based solution, net zero, offsetting. What's, what those things uh, mean? Uh, because, I don't know. So if, if you can elaborate more on that, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, so yeah, I see uh, Bessimola, I see uh, Ladislas. So um, I will open that floor to have more questions and Peter and Vanessa can, can answer them. So um, Bessimola, please, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I, I just want to ask that uh, uh, since we're discussing the issue of uh, false based solutions and um, based on the explanation that have been given to us, I want to ask this question about uh, we as uh, civil society organizations and as uh, maybe stakeholders who are really critical about this uh, false solution what how do we deal with the issue because we know that article 6 is already in a way bringing back the carbon market to us and this is part of the four solutions we've been talking about and then we as civil society in our countries knowing also that our countries are not immune from of course accepting this uh, false solutions what should be our way of addressing this at the global level and at country level. That is one part of it. The second part is this. I, I think I had some of the things said that is happening in Mozambique. For instance, I know in some countries where they can collect people's land for this false solution. And then when they collect the land, they will tell you they want to give you compensation and things like that. Somebody needs to be muted, please. Yes. So, what if, for instance, after they collect your land for this false solution thing, and then they want to give you compensation? And then a lot of people might look at it as a human rights uh, centered thing because it's, it's one of the uh, guidelines that if any land is going to be taken for overriding public interest, then it, uh, compensation must be paid. Or if people are displaced, maybe they can provide another place for them. But then that looks like they are, they are actually uh, using human rights principle. 
Meanwhile, what they wanted to do deeply, it's a, it's false solution and it won't help. So these are issues that may happen on the ground. How do we deal with that? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Akosa, for, for the questions. Uh, Ladislas, please. Merci beaucoup. Je remercie en fait le présentateur. Je remercie Peter et Vanessa pour leur brillante présentation par rapport aux fausses solutions. Et suite à leur présentation, je viens de remarquer qu'il y a beaucoup de fausses solutions qui ont été vulgarisées et multipliées en fait dans le village, province au niveau de l'Afrique. Mais maintenant, aujourd'hui, je me dis, eh, nous avions déjà vulgarisé en fait ces fausses solutions. Et à mon avis, ces fausses solutions n'étaient pas au profit des pauvres communautés. Mais est-ce que, selon la présentation de Vanessa et euh, Peter, est-ce qu'il y a des mécanismes que nous pouvons utiliser aujourd'hui pour contrecarrer en fait les fausses solutions qui ont été vulgarisées eh, dans nos villages eh, pour sauver en fait ce que nous avons aujourd'hui? Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you, Ladislas. Um, I have uh, <clears throat> Philip and then Supana later. <clears throat> Philip, you have the floor. Uh, yes, thank you. My question to Vanessa with regards to if she can, uh, Vanessa, if you can elaborate a little bit more on the plantations that's been abandoned in, I think you said, Nampula province. And I'm, I'm just wondering about the, 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 uh, the underlying reasons. Um, you spoke a little bit about some conflict, and it would be interesting to hear if the community is actually sort of, you know, making it difficult for the plantation owners to expand. And then just wondering a little bit about, you know, once plantations are in the ground, um, they become a tremendous problem. And if they are abandoned, I mean, they just spread into the natural environment. Here in South Africa, there's one and a half million hectares of managed plantations. But there's a further 1.6 million hectares of invaded plantations, um, sometimes invading into some of the most difficult areas to actually remove them uh, along the riparian zones, even up the mountains. So if you can just, uh, if you have some thoughts on that, the idea of, of how these trees can actually be removed. Um, uh, I know it's very early in the, in, in the process. And then just to confirm that, I mean, in our valley, we can see tremendous soil erosion. We can see river siltation, river degradation, biodiversity impoverishment. And it's got very little to do with climate change. It's got to do with the way that timber plantations have progressively, uh, progressively been established in this region. So thank you very much for the opportunity and for this webinar. Thank you, Philip. Um, Yeah, thank you, Kwame. Uh, this is uh, uh, to Peter. Peter, I, I was wondering that, you know, if you can see that people are, talk, uh, people are talking of false solutions all around the African continent, and then a uh, lot of invest, a lot of activities around carbon market and carbon offsets. And if we see uh, countries like Gabon, which is, I think, the second most forested country in the world, going for forest carbon offsets. And, you know, uh, why is, why are the African governments, uh, they, they are, they're saying that they, they need climate finance, but why are they going for these kind of finance, which uh, invests only in false solutions and have huge impact? but not instead into more real climate solutions because they because the African governments also talk a lot about adaptation finance. Why is this contradiction actually? Thank you, Supana, for uh, this question. Indeed, we need to understand that dynamic in Africa. Uh, yeah, now I would like to hand over to uh, the speakers. Peter first and, and uh, uh, Vanessa second. So you have the floor, Peter. 
Thank you, Kwame. Uh, and let me start by uh, thanking Vanessa for her excellent presentation, which really provided a, a, a grassroots level view of, of, of how these false solutions impact culture and, and people and, and, and basic needs. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, also, thank you to Beatrice for your question uh, regarding the, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals that you put into the chat. I agree with you that um, the continued focus on growth, economic growth, um, is a challenge within the SDGs. I think the other SDGs um, put forward uh, goals that we do support, um, but I very much acknowledge the contradiction between the, the push for continued growth, uh, that it sits uncomfortably with some of the other SDGs. With respect to offsets and the question of where this came from and why, uh, I want to make two observations. Um, the first observation is from 12 years ago, as you recall, uh, there was a pledge made by the rich countries to provide 100 billion in climate finance, and that would be climate finance for both mitigation and adaptation. That was made uh, in 2009, 2000, yes. Uh, and it's never been fulfilled. Never once have the rich countries met the obligation that they themselves set for themselves. Uh, back in 2009. They themselves took this on, um, and yet they have been unwilling and unable to fulfill that basic commitment. When you are unable to fulfill that commitment, what do you do? You try to change the conversation. And they changed the conversation in two ways. One was by talking about international cooperation for mitigation action. Well, that sounds good, international cooperation sounds like a good thing. How it actually showed up in the Paris Agreement is in something called Article 6, which even though it doesn't talk about carbon markets, was very much an attempt by the rich countries to put in a mechanism into the Paris Agreement that would allow for offsets. So both countries and companies want to use offsets. Why? Generally, because they're cheaper than taking the decarbonization efforts that should be taken by countries or in national economies to reduce emissions. It's usually cheaper to buy offsets. But why is it cheaper? It's cheaper for the reasons that Vanessa identified, which is the costs of development are socialized. The profits from development are privatized. And this is the challenge we see with offsetting and corporate net zero commitments. The other thing to say about the net zero commitments is they're basically selfish. Why? Because in net zero, as a country or a company, you are just trying to compensate for the harm, for the emissions uh, that you have created. You are just trying to compensate for that. You're trying to bring it up to zero, but zero is not what we need. We need a lot more action than just getting to zero. So we need to move from a compensation model as implied by offset markets, carbon, carbon markets and carbon offset markets, move from a compensation model to a contribution model, meaning we should be contributing to the goal of climate mitigation and adaptation. And we should not expect a financial return for doing the right thing. So in answer to your question, Suparna, I think the challenge for African governments is there's not a lot, uh, how to say this, African governments have been presented with a take it or leave it situation. That is, you can take the money associated with carbon market creation, 
offset market creation and other forms of quote international cooperation that are really attempts by selfish governments, selfish companies in the global north to compensate for their ongoing harm. We need to move away from that to a contribution model, but in conditions of indebtedness, post-pandemic, what are the options that uh, African governments have? We look forward to more solidarity between those governments to call for debt relief that allows for the fiscal space, the macroeconomic space that would enable countries to address the needs of adaptation, to address the development needs of their populations and not get stuck in the carbon offset cycle. This can be done through improved adaptation finance. And we hope at COP27, it will also show up as loss and damage finance. These are the much more important types of finance than will be found in, for example, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which again is primarily about carbon market creation. I hope that's a helpful answer and I appreciate very much the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So Vanessa, you have the floor for the answers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I have around three questions here. The first one was, what can we do as civil society groups and stakeholders if this is already uh, in Article 6, this is already decided and all our African governments are running for this. We can continue resisting. We can continue educating our communities and our rural communities particularly about what are the false solutions. And we can, con we can come together and build solidarity between African countries and between the region to make them understand what are the main, the main impacts of these false solutions. What, is, what are the impacts on the ground? And again, that's why I spoke a little bit of how poor Mozambique is. This is not, Mozambique is not the only country, the only poor country, of course. And in Africa, most of the countries have the same issues or similar issues. This makes us very dependent on these neoliberal agendas. It makes us dependent on these decisions, but we need, we need to fight back and we need to show our governments that as civil society groups, we do not agree with this. With this so these are not solutions, these are false solutions. They will not only keep the emissions coming going up, but they will also keep us continuously dependent on this, on this, um, on this financing, continuously dependent on these countries and this support. It's also important to understand there's only so much you can mitigate and adapt to. It is not possible, at least for Africa, in Mozambique is the case also, it is not possible to adapt to, for instance, um, an increase in three degrees Celsius. It, it will not be possible. So there's only so much we can do. And these, all these false solutions are basically trying to, as, as Peter said so well, they're selfish solutions because I'm just trying to do the minimum possible but we're not reducing emissions by doing this. We will maintain the same emissions. It is not possible, even if we plant trees all over this planet, it is not possible to take all the emissions that are already there. So we need, we need to fight for the real solutions on the ground, for local solutions, for sustainable solutions. And these are there, we know they are, but they're not as attractive for business. They, don't, they, they will not maintain the status quo that is already existing. So this is one thing we need to continue resisting and we need to build more solidarity between the regions. Also, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot who, who asked this question, but it, there was a question on, on people when they are removed from, from their land to give way for a mega project or one of these false solutions, be it a, a project or a, or a plantation or whatever, if they are or not compensated. Yes, they are compensated um, normally. Not always, unfortunately, but in Mozambique, the land belongs to the state. So if the state decides this, um, this project or this um, initiative is more important, they will remove the people. We do have in our land law, our land law is actually very protective of community rights, but then it, it is not implemented as it should be. We have community consultations and communities in these consultations have the right to say no to this project. 
But unfortunately, they do not know their rights. Most of these communities do not know that they have this power. And in fact, they don't. It is in the law, but they don't have the power to stop a huge project like this. They need to come together and they need to understand better the laws and their rights. So compensation is basically determined by our government and the company. So if I go, for instance, in the case of Green Resources Company, in the case of Portocell, Portocell did not compensate for land and did not pay anybody for the land they took. Basically, because you cannot sell land. This is a nice excuse. But people were only compensated for the work they did on their own land. So by leaving their land for these plantation companies, they need to clear the land to take away the vegetation. So they are paid for that work. And it's a very, very low pay. In the case of green resources and Portocell also, they were compensated for the fruit trees they had in their land, for the crops they had in their land. But again, the prices for these crops and the, for these fruit trees was established by government. There was no negotiation process. So communities either took the money that government and the company decided they were entitled to, or they took nothing and they were surrounded by trees. So there's no negotiation process uh, between communities and, and the companies. And also that not only there's not the negotiation process, the power relations are so unique. Uh, there's huge inequality between power relations, between the information accessible to the communities and to these people. For most of these communities in Nampula province and in Zambezia where Portocell and Green Resources established, they had never seen a monoculture plantation in their lives. So they don't know what we are talking about. They don't know what impacts um, like a hundred hectares of the same tree will have on their lives. They don't know what it's like to be surrounded by these trees. When you come and you say that we will plant trees, they look around and they see the trees that they know. These are new trees. This is a totally different reality. So it is very difficult for a local a community member to be able to discuss these matters with the company and with, the, with which is also another issue is that the company always comes with local government. So local government is side by side with the company. And when they approach communities, normally the information is given that this process has been decided at the central level. We are here to inform you. This is not a consultation. It's basically giving the information that the company is coming and it will bring jobs and a whole lot of promises. So although there is compensation and by law they should be compensated, there is no amount of compensation that can actually compensate for the land where you produce everything you, your life depends on. So from that land, they, take, uh, they, they produce the crops, they eat, they sell, and they live from that. What happens in many of these projects, for example, in the gas, uh, in the gas projects in Cabo Delgado, they're taking away fisher folks and put them inland. Yes, they were compensated, but they can never fish again. And they have no other skills. That's, that's what they used to do. That's the only thing they know how to do. It's to fish. If they're away from the sea, there's not an, uh, enough money that will keep them living from that money only without getting any other activity, any other revenue source. It's impossible. For most of the Mozambican uh, community members, they're mostly peasants. So they, 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 they live off agriculture, they live off the land. So they need to be able to have land. A lot of these people for the plantation companies, they are not being removed from their areas. They are only giving away part of their land, which is the part where they produce. So they crops. So they give away some part of that land. So their land becomes much smaller and they produce much less but they're not being removed because this has many other costs for the company. And it's not as attractive as just taking away the land and leaving them with a small piece of land. Porto Cell, for instance, uh, is brags of having left community members with around 1.5 to two hectares of land, each family. But the families complain that this is not enough to feed their families. And still they're complaining years after Porto Cell has been established and still nothing has been done. As for the question around uh, green resources in Nampula province, well, basically the information we got from community members and from, and from our local partners is that green resources in Nampula has declared uh, insolvency, Valencian Portuguese, what is that in English? 
uh, where they have no more money to continue working there. So basically they've informed the government that they are leaving their plantations in Nampula province, which are quite a few in, in Ribawe district, Mekuburi district, uh, Rapal. And they're leaving this with a whole lot of conflicts because ever since this uh, green resources was established in Nampula, communities, affected communities continue complain. They never stopped complaining about the compensation, the payment of compensations, about the fact that uh, there are many and many and um, broken promises. They promised a whole lot of things from hospitals to improved roads, to improved schools. None of these were, were fulfilled. And the, the communities are still requesting that green resources officials, uh, green resources workers, the director and all come to the community and inform them themselves of what is happening. From what we know from the local communities, at this moment, there is a negotiation which is being, being done through NGOs, actually. There, there are NGOs that are representing the company and they are trying to establish community associations in these affected communities to the, so that they can pass these plantations to the communities so they manage the, the plantations. Communities, these communities do not want this, this option. This is being this, this, it has a lot of resistance. It created not only conflict between the communities and local government and the company, but also conflicts within the community. But it, because of course, there are always the smartest ones who think they can make some money out of this. And corruption levels, as I said, have increased. And there are a lot of issues now that need to be dealt with within these communities. We don't know what, what will come of this. We know now, and very recently, there's, a, there's an information that there's a company interested in buying these, these plantations. They are at this stage for at least the last two years, they have been abandoned. As you said very well, Philip, there's been uh, fires already and control, that the community cannot control because they're not used to, to this sort of, of, of wildfires. Uh, there's been also uh, community members who have uh, taken down some of the trees and sold them. So there's been conflict between the communities themselves, what to do with these plantations, if they take all out or if they chop it in the, within the community, they cut it off and sell it or they burn it. So there's, there's, the, the situation is even worse now and government does not take... Um, does not take to itself to protect these communities. Basically, they are they are sides sided with the companies, and they when they go there, they go with the companies. There's a lot a lot of of, of conflict and a lot of of complaints in these communities, and all of them are still expecting their compensations. The ones that were not paid and the ones who were paid was very little compensation. Another just to finalize, another thing is how exactly. Uh, there was a question here also, how exactly are we mobilizing to resist these false solutions? Well, communities in Mozambique are not yet actually resisting the false solutions. This term is, is not, it's not um, that simple at the community level. They are resisting what they know. They're resisting the plantation that is, is impacting their lives and they know how and why. And they have seen it, they live, they're living there. But this, this idea of false solution is not as discussed. Of course, there are NGOs working with these communities, um, local NGOs, and explaining these issues. But there are also many projects, uh, red projects and, and carbon credit projects that are masked. They don't go into the community saying that we will support your community, for instance, your community forest concession. We will support it but you will be part of this bigger program for carbon credits. That does not happen. It's, it's, these projects are ongoing. Many communities are participating on them without even knowing what Red Plus is or what carbon markets is. They don't know anything about it. They are part of a process which they have no knowledge of. So it's, it's, it's a big struggle, struggle. Of course, not all NGOs are against false solutions in Mozambique also. Many believe that we are poor, we need to get as much money as we can. It doesn't matter where it comes from. If we're compensating or not, we'll deal with it later on. This is not, of course, what we believe in. This is not our position. But in many cases, we have seen many NGOs and many, many groups in civil society 
who are not against gas exploration. We are, who are not against uh, the, the gas projects, the mega projects. They are against the impacts it might come. They're against corruption. They want to deal with certain issues of these projects, but they still do believe these will bring development. So there's not a unified voice still. And that's what I believe we need to work better on. We need, we need to be clear on the impacts. We need to be more clear on what actually is happening and how we are being fooled by this, this, this funding. This is not climate funding. This is funding to keep business as usual and to keep us dependent on these solutions. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um... Peter and Vanessa. More questions are uh, in the chat, but I will ask Peter and Vanessa to look at the chat and if uh, they can answer them uh, to the chat quickly um, as we are continuing the, the, the webinar. So um, having that said, uh, I have uh, John. <laughs> Maybe let's have John first uh, and then we, we, we continue. John, you have the floor. Yes. Uh... I'm uh, from Sierra Leone. I work for the Sierra Leone Land Alliance. I actually enjoyed the presentation of uh, Peter Riggs in trying to demystify the false solutions. The issue is for us in Sierra Leone, the engagement of governments in trying to address climate change. You know, they have what they call the nationally determined contribution, which you mentioned but did not touch on. Uh, more critical to, to create an opening so that we understand how internal determined contributions will actually go to, to uh, ensure that for us in Africa, especially in Sierra Leone, when governments go to these international conferences to address climate change, they make a number of commitments that are very unknown to civil society. And in that processes, we know the Paris Agreement forms the basis upon which will be determined to know the commitment government has made because it is being so uh, divided into, into teams. And most of these teams are not. The issue is how do we address uh, climate based uh, solution if we are unaware of how government prepares is nationally determined monitor progressively how they are my question thank you uh john um by the end we we didn't listen to you very very, very well but uh, i hope uh, peter or vanessa heard you um yeah peter you have the floor Thank you. I, actually, I was just responding in the chat, Kwame, so uh, I'll, I'll pass on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peter. So um, let's move on to the, the video. Um, Koraina, will you uh, help us uh, watch the video on the uh, climate issues? And after the video, we'll continue with the second part of the webinar. Thank you. As shown by the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports on climate change adaptation and mitigation, the world is at a crossroads. We are already seeing the devastating impacts of a 1.1 degree Celsius temperature rise. We are over 420 parts per million of CO2, and we need rapid transformations across all systems to avoid the worst climate impacts. To limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, global greenhouse gas emissions must peak before 2025 and be reduced by 43% by 2030. But current climate pledges and promises made by governments and corporations will not take us to where we need to be. We don't have time for false solutions, such as carbon markets and offsets, net zero pledges, large-scale monoculture tree plantations, bioenergy, technofixes and smart agriculture systems. 
The most vulnerable groups like indigenous peoples, women and frontline communities continue to feel the increasingly devastating effects of climate change. We must urgently address the intertwined crisis of climate change, deforestation and biodiversity loss. Luckily, the solutions are out there. Many grassroots groups are already implementing gender-just and transformative real climate solutions. They are fighting to secure collective rights to forests, land and water for indigenous peoples, local communities and women. La rentabilisation du mode de vie des peuples autochtones et en particulier les femmes en territoire de Walikali, nous sommes en train de mener une expérience de développement socio-économique en lien avec l'élaboration du plan simple de gestion dans la concession forestière de à Makassar. Les femmes autochtones sont réunies, sont mises en groupe qui développe différentes activités, notamment les activités d'élevage de, de, de stabilisation des caprins, l'élevage des de, de poules, mais aussi on développe des activités eh, agricoles en lien avec l'alimentation familiale et non extensive. Et dans ce genre d'activités, on met en exergue Women are taking the lead to conserve and protect the biodiversity and ecosystem functions that the communities need to sustain themselves. Au Bénin, en particulier dans la commune de Basila, les femmes rurales pratiquent l'apiculture par des méthodes durables, c'est-à-dire contrairement à ceux qui font l'usage du feu de brousse. Pour la récolte du miel, elles utilisent du matériel adéquat, notamment l'accoutrement. En plus de cela, ce qui est plus intéressant encore chez ces femmes est qu'elles procèdent au reboisement de leurs forêts ruchées par des espèces de plantes mellifères. Na defesa de seus territórios, da floresta e da biodiversidade, as mulheres se destacam. Elas são as principais guardiões das sementes criolas. Elas resguardam toda uma biodiversidade, plantas medicinais em seus quintais, raças criolas também de pequenos animais. Então elas têm um papel fundamental na conservação ambiental é, e também no combate às mudanças climáticas. Indigenous peoples, local communities and women are practicing transformative agriculture, like agroecology, one of the most equitable and just ways of addressing our climate crisis. Nosotros como mujeres somos las que nos quedamos en nuestras comunidades a cuidar nuestro, nuestro bosque. Estamos haciendo huerto familiar y también apoyando también al medio ambiente eh, en nuestro propio proyecto que estamos haciendo. Eh, está también reforestar también en lugares donde, donde ha sido quemado. Communities and movements are increasingly mobilizing to fight for their rights and to preserve ecosystems and natural resources. There cannot be real climate action without gender, climate and social justice. And it's not as hard as it sounds. We can do this if we focus on the real solutions that already exist.
Thank you, Koraina, for showing this video. Um, this um, brought us to the second part of this uh, webinar. So we'll be hearing uh, two presentations. Uh, the first one will lead us to understand the link uh, with all those discussed to COP27. And then uh, the second one will be calling uh, Jose, Jose from uh, um, Congo, uh, to talk about the letter uh, to uh, AMSEN in terms of campaign uh, towards uh, uh, the leadership in Africa. So having that said, um, let me quickly share my screen um, so we can see. I hope you can see my screen. Yeah. So um, just to recall quickly that uh, uh, from the history of the COP, COP, COP has happened four times already in Africa. So the first one was uh, in Morocco, the second one in Kenya in 26, uh, the third one was in, 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 in Durban, South Africa in 2011, uh, COP 17. And uh, the, the fourth one was in Morocco, uh, Marrakesh, uh, COP 22. And the fifth one is coming. So, um, are we, are we going to talk uh, uh, about uh, uh, African COP? Because all those COPs that happened in Africa was never be uh, an African COP. So how are we going to, uh, to own the COP in Sharma Sheikh? That's a that's very big question we are asking ourselves. So, uh, but looking at uh, the first solutions that have been promoted by uh, polluters, the, the, the impact of uh, the results of COPs uh, 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 in Africa is huge. So climate change is continued devastating Africa. So uh, because of uh, those four solutions promoted, net zero uh, uh, or uh, uh, nature-based solutions, polluters just trying to uh, continue emitting. So nothing's happening. So what we have been seeing in Africa is uh, 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 the, 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 the frequency of cyclones and storms and the coastal erosion, uh, sea level rise. So those impacts are still. And this year in January, 2022, we have, uh, 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 we, 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 we had uh, a tropical storm, Anna, for instance, that destroyed uh, the coast of Malawi, Mozambique, uh, uh, Madagascar, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mauritius. So the impact is still there because of the promotion of those four solutions that Peter was talking about. As we are discussing uh, to keep the, uh, to move from fossil fuels to, uh, to renewable, for instance, the leaders in Africa still maintaining the business as usual. So in, in September, for instance, 15, September 15, uh, uh, and a memorandum was uh, 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 a memorandum of understanding to build a pipeline from, Morocco, from Nigeria to Morocco was signed by the leaders of ECOWAS, including uh, the head of states of, of ECOWAS. So just to link to the uh, Maghreb pipeline and to shift the gas to, to, to Europe. Still, it means that the fossil fuels industry is still expand, expanding in Africa. But we need to move from fossil fuel, we are saying. So uh, for us in COP27, to own that COP, there should be less participation of first solution promoters. The COP should deal with, uh, 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 with that, limiting uh, the participation of, of, of first solution promoters. So the voice of polluters need to be uh, uh, ignored, totally ignored, because uh, uh, it's not helping the climate. So we need to take into consideration the, 
messages of climate justice movements as we are doing now. I think we, we need to continue emphasizing on it and uh, uh, call for uh, the COP27 presidency uh, to increase badge for civil society and uh, climate justice movements. The activists need to be uh, in, in, in COP and space need to be uh, there for them to protest against false solutions and to promote real solution uh, to COP. Um, our key demands, the key demands uh, uh, alongside with our campaign, net zero agenda should be out of climate agenda and more finance for loss and damage, but those finances cannot be alone because um, some of the times they just give us loans uh, for uh, 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 to combat uh, or to repair for reparation. We don't want that. We want free funding, um, but strong funding to uh, to go with uh, loss and damage and stop fossil industry expansion. That three point on the agenda will be good, and we're going to. Uh, uh, mobilize civil society organization. We want, we, we, we're going to get uh, media attention to denounce all false solutions during the negotiation, such as offsetting uh, project, biomass expansion, um, monoculture plantations, uh, geoengineering. I think those are the things we're going to uh, put media on to denounce all those things at COP27. We're going to amplify the voice of indigenous people and local communities affected by the climate crisis. It's very important that those voices, uh, uh, it's very important to emphasize or amplify those voices because uh, uh, they are the ones uh, being affected mostly by, by climate change. And women's, women as well, women's voices uh, will be promoted at COP27. We're going to organize more joint events, action on real solutions to challenge the uh, corporate uh, presence in COP. And uh, uh, I think together we need to do that. So what we don't want, we don't want uh, Africa to be cooked. So um, to avoid Africa to be cooked, I think uh, uh, it's very important to, to take into consideration some other things. So here I'm presenting uh, a, a book that uh, um, Nimo Basse uh, wrote to cook a continent. And one of the key, <clears throat> one of the key elements on, 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 on this is uh, the, the issue related to uh, to the natural resource exploitation, corporate uh, profiteering and climate change must be considered together if the planet is to be saved, of course. But what we have been seeing in COP, they are promoting those things. Natural resources exploitation are being promoted. Still, corporates are profiting from uh, 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 the nature. So that needs to be stopped. So real talk, which profits people and planets, not polluters, must be on the agenda of COP27. So we, we need to raise more awareness to our governments and delegates to the COP27 on false solutions to avoid our continent to be cooked. So now that we understand better what we call false solutions, I think at the COP27, we need to be speaking to that frequently so our delegates uh, also understand what we stand for. That's very important. Uh, so unless the COP discuss and agree on the real solutions to climate change, it can never be an African COP. So I think uh, I will leave it here. Uh, and thank you for uh, your attention. Um, so let's let's continue with uh, the presentation from uh, um, from Jose.
Josué, are you there, Josué? Yeah, I'm there. Yes, please, you have the floor uh, for your presentation. Tell us about the letter, please. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Merci beaucoup, uh, Kwame. Uh, au fait, je voulais parler ici sur uh, le leadership africain par rapport au groupe de travail sur le travail déjà réalisé uh, le mois dernier. That has already been realized last, last month. In September, we had some meeting and we wanted to share with you some updates about leadership uh, from civil society, from African civil society. So I hope you can see my screen. Here we have some points. So the first update is the letter that was uh, sent to the uh, ministerial conference about environment here in Dakar, in Senegal. And this conference, ministerial conference joins in September and it was received by the African Secretariats. In this letter, we showed our position as a African civil society to say no about geoengineering. We don't want Africa to receive so much geoengineering. Senegal, Zambia, and Egypt really wanted to maintain geoengineering on their agenda. But the majority of participants said no. The problem is that after we have sent this letter, we didn't get any feedback. Another update. Is that, is that thanks to this advocacy, Kenya rejected explicitly geoengineering during this meeting. And afterwards, Zambia joined Kenya in this uh, saying no, even if at the beginning they were not so opposed to this. So for the moment, it's a little victory. And it's a victory because we managed that some states understand and said no to geoengineering. But we still have some steps to uh, to continue. So for our friends who are here for the first time in this time in this type of meeting, so maybe let's talk about what is geoengineering and why is it so dangerous. So geoengineering means uh, ge technological intervention at big scale. That can be done in the ocean, on the soil, or in the atmosphere of the earth. And the objective is to modify some symptoms of climate change more than face the deep causes. So what are the consequences of this? Those type of technology can really um, unbalance the climate the climate regimes are uh, at local and regional level it can cause more natural catastrophes uh, it have deep consequences on ecosystems on biodiversity and of course uh, food security 
And we can see that this type of technologies can also threaten peace at the world level. So what is our position from the civil society in Africa? So Africa and its inhabitants, they are not a laboratory to test technologies that can change environments on a planetary scale. And as it had been said, Africa is one of the least of the region that least contributed to climate change. And we really reject these proposals that want us to be a laboratory to test new technologies. So this technology, we have to be aware of it, can change the whole climate. And we don't want to see in our territory, our region, we don't want to see this type of technology that we know are deeply dangerous. So we reject any position that would lead us to be a laboratory as we know that these technologies can really affect um, biodiversity and entail and threaten uh, well-being of the communities here in Africa and in the whole world. So thank you for, for this. Thank you very much, uh, Josue, for the presentation. Yes, we don't want ge geoengineering in Africa. That's very clear. So uh, our governments need to, to understand that. Thank you so much. We now open the floor to uh, for questions uh, uh, and reflections. But, but before that, I would like to inform you that uh, uh, we're supposed to have uh, Melania Chiponda from uh, Femnet and Asad Riman from World and in, in this webinar, but uh, uh, they are not here for some reason we don't know yet. So uh, yeah, just to inform you, thank you very much uh, for those uh, who are here. And thank you for Kwame and Josue for the presentation. So we now open the floor for questions of clarification, questions, comments, and uh, uh, reflection. If, yeah, thank you, you have the floor. Everything was clear. Congratulations, Josue. I don't see any hands. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah, one hand. Oh no, uh, Valentina. Valentina. Thank you for congratulating uh, um, Josue. Okay. So um, if we don't have. Uh, any hands, then we will proceed with the closure of uh, of the webinar. Okay. So. Um, Um, could I know? Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, any information to give? Um, no, not on my end. I leave the closing remarks to you or any of the panelists that want to give any closing remark. Thanks, okay. everyone. So thank you, Corina. No announcement. So uh, I would love to give the floor to Peter and uh, Vanessa for the final word, and then we uh, we close the webinar. So Peter first, and Vanessa and Josue as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you very much. Peter, will you please give your final words? Yes, thank you. It took me a moment to unmute. Thank you, Kwame. 
Um, I really appreciate your focus on what can be achieved at uh, COP27, an African crop to take place in Egypt. I would also ask colleagues to pay attention to non-market solutions, which is Article 6.8. Uh, the other parts of Article 6 have already been launched. Uh, those are the ones focused on carbon markets. We were promised a balanced outcome on Article 6 at COP26 in Glasgow. So now, a year later, it's time to deliver on the promise of a balanced package, meaning that in addition to the what we see as the false solutions in 6.4, Let's promote the real solutions in Article 6.8, non-market approaches, to building a solidarity economy, joint mitigation and adaptation, community-led solutions. Africa can be in the lead to support Article 6.8. Please urge your governments to prioritize outcomes and funding in Article 6.8 at the upcoming COP. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this excellent webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Vanessa, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. It was very, very good to, to, to listen to all the presentations made were very clear, very interesting. And it's, it's all that we are discussing now and here. I think we need to be strong on this COP. It is taking place in Africa, yes, but I do not see it as an African COP, and I hope we can still change that. We need to we need to bring and we need to be louder and clearer on the solutions that we are, as Africa, we are proposing on the ground solutions, localized. We need solutions that are discussed locally. We do not need a recipe, a made-up recipe from from the global north to be imposed on us. So we need to ensure that the solutions that we already see in our countries are, are brought to this COP as agroecology initiatives, as saving seeds initiatives, as as the as what the, the movie also, the little documentary that you showed also showed, we need to bring these voices and we need to bring these solutions as our solutions, non-market solutions. We cannot continue to disguise this this um, disguise action based on these market solutions and false solutions because these are not solving any issue at all. They don't address the causes and they keep us doing business as usual. And it's, it's, it's like a crazy person. We do the same thing and expect different results. It will not work. And as you said, Kwame, we need to make sure, and as Nemo well put it in his book, we need to make sure we don't cook our continent because we need it and we live in it. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for letting us share our struggles also with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Josue, you have the floor for your final word. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde et à tous les collègues. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues, for this presentation, for this debate. As you said, um, the struggle is still going on. And we need to keep, um, make our voice heard. And we hope we will have space and we will have a, a role to play uh, during this COP. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Josue, for uh, uh, your words. And uh, I'm glad that Home Campaign is working with uh, uh, many of the organization that are against geoengineering. So um, that mechanism is already in place. So we're going to use uh, Home Campaign uh, together with uh, other organizations, networks, Global Forest Coalition, uh, uh, Friends of the Earth International uh, to push back geoengineering and push back all those four solutions at COP27. So uh, I'm glad that uh, many of you here are connected. Uh, um, even if you are not attending COP, we are sure that uh, you will be uh, uh, connected. So you can relay our social media, you can relay 
our communication, our messages. So uh, the, the, the government know what uh, we are saying and we are talking about. So no first solutions and uh, we promote real solutions. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining this uh, webinar. And for sure, in future, we'll be seeing you again into our activities. More strength to us. Until victory, thank you very much. Bye-bye.